Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing? Good, Bruce. How are you doing? I'm all right. So we're having kind of an unscheduled podcast. We usually reserve our podcast during the season for after games, but um, some pretty big news here with Don Cherry moving on, uh, not willingly getting fired from his job at Sportsnet after all these years. He talked about being fired forever, how he mm-hmm. expected to be fired, and and here we have it. So, Bruce, we're going to talk about Don Cherry, the hockey commentator, his strengths, his weaknesses, and where Sportsnet is going to be moving next. So, um, do you want me to start? Strengths. Sure. Strengths. Go Don Cherry strengths. All right. Listen, I... I'll start out with this. I haven't watched Coach's Corner regularly. It, it used to be appointment hockey, yeah. appointment viewing for me. Yes. Everything Don Cherry said at one point was really, really interesting. Kind of like Brian Burke is now, how I find Brian Burke to be now. Everything Brian Burke says now is really interesting. Don Cherry was that way for a long time, for like 20 years. Through the 1980s and 1990s, he took over from Howie Meeker as kind of the main voice of hockey canadian hockey and um everything he said was really compelling it was a it was a time when canadian hockey itself was kind of challenged by the foreign game and that's how it was seen you know the you know first kind of this overt challenge from the communists from the soviet union from from the bad guys and you know challenging our way of life as phil esposito put it in 1972 And Don Cherry became uh, kind of a compelling and passionate advocate for the Canadian game as he defined the Canadian game, which was a kind of a a hockey built on grit and violent play and tough guys standing up for their teammates and loyalty and team play, fierceness, you know, rock'em, sock'em hockey, Canadian hockey. (laughs) And he was the kind of the leader of our tribe in terms of defining and defending that style of hockey. And as a Canadian hockey chauvinist myself, I kind of liked that. So that, to me, was uh, Don's strength, and he fulfilled that role for a long time. Uh, Again, I think, and we're going to get into his weaknesses and why I stopped finding him interesting, but that's what I liked about him. What about you? Well, yeah, he was always a driver of the conversation. I mean, right from the beginning, he said things that... um, I vehemently disagreed with and other things that I thought, yeah, that probably needed to be said. And uh, uh, he, he would draw attention sometimes to, uh, uh, you know, hits and, and uh, plays that cross the line. And sometimes he would defend the hitter, but sometimes he would he would speak up when, when a hit did endanger someone. Uh, he had some interesting views on, on uh, player safety that... Uh, uh, in some ways, we're a throwback, uh, for instance, uh, going back to soft leather shoulder pads as opposed to uh, weaponized shoulder caps, which are, you know, used now as a point of contact as a point of, as opposed to a point of protection. And so some, some of those, uh, uh, some of those viewpoints, on the other hand, he Is had he against anti- helmets, Bruce? Antiqu- he against helmets? antiquated views about visors in particular. Oh, yes. And that it was a sign of unmanliness or some darn thing. And, uh, uh, I mean, eye safety is everything. You lose an eye, you lose your career. So, uh, in the, in the long run, I mean, eventually they did mandate in the helmets and they did mandate in the visors after that. And before that they mandated in goalie masks, you know, I mean, these were things that, um, uh, unfortunately de- have, have a net impact of depersonalizing the game. You're not as close to, the players today uh, as you were in the 1960s in some important respects, right? Like they, they're very much more figures on the ice as opposed to people with, you know, real faces and hairlines and everything else that, that you can see and identify with. And he, let's say, uh, he got pretty set in his ways and uh, he was in the beginning and, and as he you know, grew later in life, that wasn't about to change. And I really didn't. So. Yeah. I've heard the argument about, um, 
the hardness of equipment being related to greater injury in in the play. So players fear less for their safety. They move faster. They're able to move faster because they're more protected, but it leads to more catastrophic injury. And especially in relation to football and helmets, they used to wear soft helmets in yep. football way back in the day. And they, when, when the helmet in football became actually a weapon um, to spear other players, I think that was a kind of a cogent argument about yep. that. And I, and I think that's an interesting point about shoulder pads, like mm-hmm. elbow pads, you know, with these plastic, hard plastic caps. And I guess they do probably increase safety. It'd be nice to have some trade-off in that. So I, I don't think it's a completely irrelevant or crazy point that he was making. You know, if, if players don't have helmets, they're more careful on the ice. There's a different kind of code of play. Like I remember the argument back in the day was you, goalies used to get mad about high shots because they didn't wear face masks. So the goalies would chastise their own teammates for doing that, using that tactic. But of course, Bobby Hull came along and blew that out of the out of the water in in the actual gameplay itself. So... Well, the goalies still don't like getting high shots in the warm-ups. They, they do coming. not. They do not. <laughs> yeah, so he, I think he was very relevant for, for through the 1980s, uh, through the 1990s even, but increasingly less so because, you know, as he moved to kind of a more rah-rah and non-hockey political commentary, he just he just became less and less interesting to me to the point, and that now we're getting into his negatives, where both his cultural, his worldview on culture, but mainly his hockey worldview. I didn't stop watching him because he started to talk about politics so much. I mean, that was of no interest to me at all, his his views on politics, honestly. Mm-hmm. But he his views on hockey became increasingly kind of, you know, his he was against, as I recall, he was against shot blocking initially because and people might want to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but because it would screen the goalie. And then he was definitely against putting out your stick Stick to block the the shot. You know, stick on puck is a basic tactic of the modern game. It's taught at every level of hockey, and he was still preaching against stick on puck. And and I get it. Like, when the puck's coming in late, like that last moment, just in front of the goalie, to maybe back off on stick on puck. But if you don't get stick on puck, you can't play hockey today. And he just... That issue, and on numerous issues, Bruce, he just seemed completely out of touch with modern hockey. Like, he didn't know what he was talking about at all. And, he like, he hadn't talked to a modern hockey coach, a modern NHL hockey coach or skills coach in 20 years. And after a while, it, it got to be, like, it just it was annoying, frankly, like, to have someone with that kind of platform preaching things that no one believed in anymore about hockey. Like, I don't know, that's how I saw it. I just thought... Why bother listening to him? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, some, some uh, many of his views were were antiquated, and you know the the, the weekly highlight package always interesting, but uh, dare I say cherry picked uh, uh, highlights of one shot that a defenseman gets a stick on and tips it into the top corner, and no highlights of the fifty shots that the defenseman tipped into the into the crowd. I mean. I'm guessing in the 1960s that uh, Don Cherry probably loved Jacques Le Perrier, who was an absolute ace at that art of tipping pucks into the end of the uh, end blues at the Montreal Forum. <laughs> and yet he, he, he sort of had his few topics that he just pounded on and pounded on. And of course, when you have a league with so many games and so many teams, you're going to find highlights to support almost anything. It's a question of balance. And, I didn't find that his coverage was particularly balanced, and and uh, frankly, even from the beginning, um, some of the uh, commentary. I mean, chicken sweets. Come on, like that was that just that yeah. He was never resonated with me. I thought that that was uh, you know a labeling of an entire group of people. That's that's going in a dangerous direction, and I'm. I'm frankly amazed he lasted as long as he did with some of the controversial things he said over the years. Yeah, he would pick on Swedes, Russian, Czechs, Finns. Like, you know, like he was just... Americans, even. Americans, yeah. He was a total Canadian hockey chauvinist. Um, You know, he lost me, Bruce, with... um, He lost me in the the 80s, even. Um, Because I always felt like... He loved Bobby Orr, so it seemed like mm-hmm. he liked Fair he enough. liked he liked one skill player. He venerated one skill player, but nobody else. Not like I always felt with the 1980s Oilers, he was very 
grudging in his praise of Gretzky and of the Oilers' skill game. He never focused on it. He never celebrated it. Like, honestly, he never celebrated that style of hockey. And it was, you know, the Oilers were a very tough team at that time, obviously, with players like Messier and Semenko, and, like, they, they took care of that end of it. But what made that team was their skill and was Wayne sure. Gretzky's skill and his and his unorthodox style of play, you know, rewriting the rules of hockey, doing things nobody, doing five or five, between five and ten things that were completely original and nobody had done on a hockey rink before. That was Wayne Gretzky. And Cherry never celebrated that fact, that innovation. And so... Put on Cherry boy, learned on his backyard rink, taught by his dad. What's not to like? An assist is as good as a goal. I mean... Yeah, I just... <laughs> You know, we're so traditional about hockey in Canada, Bruce, like the way the game should be played. And I, and I wrote a recent column about this, like with the Oilers' new tactic of passing the puck up the middle of the ice and how to this day in minor hockey circles, kids will be berated, scolded, benched even if they pass the puck up the middle of the ice, if they take that chance. And now it's being done at the NHL level. But yet in minor hockey, you'll still have that. This is going to hold on forever, right? Like never pass the puck up the middle of the ice. Like the world, hockey changes. It, it changes and you, and new, there's new techniques and new tactics. And this was the great innovation from, from, you know, the Russian hockey of Tarasov, like the, the cherry never was on board with it. And the Europeans, just the, the, the new ideas that came in from that hockey, which now are fully integrated into Canadian hockey, thankfully, and which the Oilers, which Glenn Sather completely embraced in the 1980s after watching the Winnipeg Jets and how they played hockey Nielsen, Hedberg, and Hull, and Sh- and Schuberg, and how he say they took on that, and you know, even then, Don was a little was behind the times in that regard. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm not going to miss him as a hockey commentator. So, what do they do next? It's interesting, Bruce, because I think the world, like Coach's Corner, ho- the whole hockey night in Canada thing, in a way, is from an, a past era. It was when there was two stations, three stations, one hockey broadcast once a week, and then there, you got twice a week, then three times. So Hockey Night in Canada had this singular place in Canadian culture, Saturday Night Hockey, which now is completely gone and has been gone for some time. But it's just completely gone now with the internet when there's so much. So there's never going to be another Coach's Corner. In fact, there isn't Coach's Corner now. What it was is what isn't what it used to be. You know, the cultural currency that it had 20, 30 years ago is, is gone already. And so, like, when we talk about replacing Don Cherry on Coach's Corner, like, th- that's done. It's it's over. But they, they need, they're going to need a top hockey analyst, nonetheless. So I, I've been, I wrote a post today on who might be uh, some good picks. To me, the hands-down guy, the best hockey commentator right now is Ray Ferraro, but he works for TSN. I think he's got a long-term contract there. Ray's good because he's able to immediately watch, watch the game, immediately dissect the game. And he's not afraid to chastise the play. Like he, he will name names of the player, but he doesn't pick on the player. He just says, this player did this mistake. doesn't make too much of it, but so many ex players are, won't do that. They won't say the the name of the player who made the mistake because they're still see themselves as on the team. It's very annoying, and and um, Ferraro doesn't do it, so he'd be my top. You know, if you're if you're looking for, if Sportsnet is looking for someone to be their top hockey analyst between periods, Ray Ferraro is easily the hands down pick that I see. Well, yeah, Ferraro is. I mean, he's an analyst between whistles. You know, play a color guy, uh, non perial as far as I'm concerned, and he's. Uh, uh, as a between periods, or as a panelist, or as a radio interview, whatever format, uh, he excels at it. He is so articulate. He has such a, a deep knowledge of the game. I think he has a sense of fair play. Uh, as you say, he will uh, he will say the players who are involved in the play, and he'll talk about who did what right and who did what wrong, uh, but in an even-handed manner. I mean, in some ways, I mean, in the analysis that we do at the Cult of Hockey, I kind of try and do that myself. What, what are these guys, you know, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Nobody's perfect. Nobody's, like, completely terrible that plays in the NHL. All, you know, they all have their their purpose. And you, you do, you know, criticize the play, not the player, uh, at least, you know, in, 
as you're mounting the evidence at a certain point, you, you may criticize the overall results of that player, but you have to pick your spots. And, and uh, uh, I think uh, Ferraro, for the reasons that you say, I don't think he's a possibility and certainly not <clears throat> during the current season. I mean, this is a mid-season replacement. I mean, ironically enough, uh, Don Cherry got fired on uh, November 11th and there's a lot of season to go. But um, they're going to have to find their replacement uh, internally if indeed they choose to try and fill the format with some focal point um, analyst. And who would that be? Brian Burke. I, yeah. I think he's the obvious I choice. Think, I mean, because he's going to go to. So, okay, he's, he's kind of an advocate of heavy, a modern advocate of heavy hockey and in a, in a kind of an up to date way that Cherry isn't, wasn't, hasn't been, I should say. Um, and, and Burke is in that school where, Bruce, I find everything that um, Brian Burke has to say right now, I find to be kind of interesting and, and on topic and on the ball. And um, he's great on Oilers now. He's great whenever uh, – can you hear me there? Is that working? Yeah. yeah. He, he, so Burke is great on Oilers now. He's great on TV. Everything he says is interesting. Um, he'd be fine. Like, now that might be too similar, right? Like maybe they're thinking they, they got to get someone – someone different in there but um he's the obvious he's the obvious choice i think to to step in and and uh be an interesting i'd start watching it again if brian burke was the if you gave eight minutes to brian burke i'd watch those eight minutes yeah yeah i mean he's got that um that gift that um uh the early to mid don cherry had of of making a case uh, that, I mean, I, I as a viewer find, uh, or as a listener, find that I often uh, disagree with Brian Burke, and sometimes I vehemently disagree with uh, with uh, with uh, some of his opinions, but they're usually interesting. They do draw some kind of reaction. I mean, the last thing you want is some guy that goes on there and rambles on about nothing for seven or eight minutes. I mean, make a case, support your case, uh, but, you know, try at least be somewhat fair-minded about them. And I, I'm with you. Like, I listen to Burke's um, bits on Oilers now uh, every week, and, and uh, I always find them fairly compelling listening. And, I mean, he's 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 a little bit too old school for my liking. I mean, the, I guess the other option would be who do you find that's new school that's still going to come on and say interesting things that's, you know, got enough gravitas that they've developed over you know their careers that uh, people are going to go hey i want to listen to that guy every saturday night yeah good luck with that right like that's a very difficult thing to do you need someone who can both who both has a very firm grasp on all the new trends like just gets it like understands how hockey should be played like you know like dave tippett right you know you but dave tippett's employed by the Oilers, so is ralph kruger by the by the by the sabers you know, like some of these bright hockey coaches. So it's good luck with it. Um, you know, I a couple dark horse candidates. Ken Hitchcock. I saw um, that. Ken Hitchcock. <laughs> he has no. He hasn't been a broadcaster, but he's been interviewed every day for the last you know, thirty he's, years. He's and a he's, skilled orator. He is a. He's got the gift of gab, like Ferraro. He's a talker. He could do this. I, I think he would be a very interesting pick and uh, could get the job done. And I would watch Ken Hitchcock for sure. Uh, Kevin Bieksa, I don't know if you've caught Bieksa. Uh, he is funny and he yeah. is sharp. Oh, he is both those things. Okay. And I think he's going to need some surprised. grooming, but the, he, he tells it like it is. Um, he's from this, of course, from the grit school, right? Cause that's the way he played hockey, but, um, he would be very, very, very entertaining in a, in a, in a different way, in a completely different way than Burke or Cherry are entertaining because he's, 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 an, you know, someone of this century, uh-huh. not of the last century. So they, uh-huh. they might want to go in that direction. But if, if that's what, if that's what they're looking for, you know, that would be the absolutely bold choice, but um, it's very difficult like uh, for anyone and you and I as fans, you know, try to provide some, you know, common, astute commentary and, and do our best at it. It's, it, and, and I think this gives both of us, it certainly gives me some respect for people who can really pull it off. And, um, so that's why I have such respect for Ray Ferraro and, 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 uh, you know, it's too bad in a way that he's not with Sportsnet right now, cause they could just plug him in there and that would be fantastic. 
but um, yeah, I, I, I wonder what they will do. What do you, what, you know, my I'll guess get, is, I'll, go ahead. I'll give you another dark horse with a local okay. angle and the same reason that they wouldn't probably put Ken Hitchcock into such a high profile position without having gone through his paces in the broadcast industry. Uh, likely not, but he might be an interesting uh, uh, thought in the in this thing, and that is Craig McTavish. Yeah, and again, another, another skilled orator, and he and he always has he has a sick way with words that gets it gets you thinking and reacting, and and uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, too glib for his own good on occasion, you know, bold moves and so on. Like, but uh, as a as a, I'm looking forward to seeing him now that he's out of Russia after eight games. I'm uh, just I'm looking forward to seeing him in some aspect uh, somewhere in hockey media. I enjoyed his short time that he was with TSN between gigs in the past, and and so he's fun, but probably not for that specific slot. So, well, how about this? How about Hitchcock and McTavish? <laughs> no, I know Sportsnet was trying to cut salary, like they. A lot, a lot of people lost their jobs over the summer. Yeah. So they're probably going to just, it's probably just going to be someone who's already there, right? So it's probably going to be Burke, you know, because, and and of course they're not going to call it. They're going to have to have some new format. They're, it's just going to be, they won't even make a big deal. What they should do is not even make a big deal out of it. Just have Burke come on, not even with Ron McLean. Like Ron can have other responsibilities, do some other job for a while, make him play by play or whatever. I don't know if he's skilled enough, if he, if he's got a background in that, but don't make it coach's corner. Just have, and between the first period of hockey night in Canada, we're just going to have Brian Berkey, you know, Berkey on, and he's going to talk hockey mm -hmm. and that'll be, and the NHL and maybe with Elliot Friedman talking to him and interviewing him. Um, so I, I think that might work in the short term. I think if they try, if, if they call it GM's corner or like, you know, the, the They'll they'll relabel it. They'll relabel. They'll relabel. It. Yeah. Maybe they. You know. Maybe they. There's money to be made though, in trying to brand something, like in trying to get something mm -hmm. in there. I guess if if that's what they're all about, and and they are, they've got to make some money. Maybe they need to have something. So, I my bet is, Burke. Mine is too. I mean, and he, he has such a, he has such a wealth, of background, uh, okay. Brian Burke. You know, in, in the game. Uh, we're having worked in the league, uh, having been GM of several teams, including multiple Canadian teams that he's uh, yeah. uh, that he's been involved in, and now he's well ensconced in the media business. And you know, it's not like they'd be picking him out of nowhere; they'd be picking him off the top of the pile, to be honest. So I think that he's uh, the likely outcome. The one sort of wild card suggestion that I read in my brief forays into Twitter. Uh, the last, uh, I've been doing other stuff uh, the last uh, day or so, but uh, someone suggested Haley Wickenheiser as a uh, but has she Has she done any commentating work? Well, uh, she has, but not at, not at any kind of high profile level. I think, I mean, I think she's done uh, commentary on um, um, uh, Canadian Championship women's hockey games and, and things of that nature. Kind of the same kind of stuff that Randy Gregg did, you know, where like kind of a sidelight that... And how was wanted, she? Uh, I think, all right. But I don't know that compelling enough to... But there was, I think the suggestion was just, you know, let's rock the boat and do something different. And yeah, if, whether if she's it's good. her or whether it's, you know, yeah. somebody that's completely out of left field, I mean... Uh, insert name here, but uh, uh, we've tossed out a couple. But uh, what I don't expect to see is some some fresh analytical uh, person going into the spot and and providing more of a 21st century uh, approach because I just don't think it fits the format. And I think their audience is is the Saturday Night Hockey Night in Canada is you know old guys like you and me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, like analytics, if, you know, I'd like, like to so see we, some we talk analytics, Bruce, sometimes yeah. it's very difficult to talk about numbers, right? Yeah. So we boil it down like one number after a whole game. Like we, so, and I, the, I think you can talk, do it that way, but to talk numbers and to make it interesting, that is a huge challenge. It's, it's a huge challenge to write a blog post with numbers and to, and I find it to chat, like to read blog posts with a lot of numbers to know exactly what they're talking about and. Like this is a very difficult thing to get across on broadcast on on six minutes or four minutes, whatever you have. So I'm not, 
I'm not, if you can find someone who can do that, hire them. But I don't, I, I haven't seen that person yet. In my defense, analytical is a different word than just to analytics. It's analyzing, you know, and just more, more of a modern uh, view of the game. I mean, you mentioned Howie Meeker earlier and he, he revolutionized uh, hockey broadcasting. And in fact, I think they kind of lost their way in terms of, of uh, Howie's form of analysis of, you know, of team play, stick a camera way up in the highest corner of the rafters and see where everybody goes and put a telestrator on them and back it up, back it up, stop it right there. And, you know, and he'd, he'd single out and get your attention on who's doing what that's causing that. And I, I wish we had more of that, frankly. And well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because he was the real coach's corner. Like, he, okay. I don't know if how he coached. I can't remember. But I think he did coach for a year. Um, but he he was. Yeah. He was the coach for a nation. He, he did teach us hockey in a way that Don Cherry never did. And, no. and I think if you had that kind of astute hockey mind, like a Ken Hitchcock, actually teaching hockey, talking hockey, not necessarily numbers, but an, but a, right. an analytical. Ferraro is very analytical. Mm, yes, it, these are all right. highly analytical people who have talent stacks, who have talents far outside of the people who just deal with the numbers of hockey. Like they've been players, they've often been coaches, they've got all kinds of experience. They understand. You're telling me Ray Ferraro doesn't understand all the advanced stats? He understands them completely and knows their value. So, like this kind of commentator. Um, I would be really open to. And I think, I, th I think could do some good, but again, it, we're never going to have that same kind of cachet for this position. Cause it's just, it's one voice among millions. We're all on Twitter. Now we all get our say, and this is just one more person with the say they've got a, a bigger platform, yeah, but oh, it's yeah. not like, it's not like the old days. So it's not the bully pulpit of once was sure. Isn't it? And it's a good thing. Like we get our say, Bruce, like two hockey fans hey, here got a podcast now, man. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's all, it's, uh, yeah. So a lot of people, some people were saying, oh, you shouldn't be talking about this. You know, it's the, the body isn't cold. And I just think, come on, like he, Cherry had a great run. Don Cherry had a lengthy, lengthy run. He worked till he was 85. Like that, yeah. I, if anything was inspirational about Don Cherry to me in the end, you know, it's, he was going strong at 85. Good for Don Cherry. And that, that is a true inspiration. Mm -hmm. Good for him. He had a great, great career on Hockey Night in Canada. He had a great run. It's over now, and um, time to move on. The world, the world, Bruce changes, and it's time to move on. Yeah, you could say the same thing about Bob Cole. You know, he went till he was eighty-five years old. Yeah, and uh, maintained his passion for the game right to the very end. Uh, you could say that his his talent slipped over the you know the last twenty years of his career, but. Uh, uh, you know, at a certain point, it's time to change lines, you know, <laughs> do it on the fly and get, uh, get someone over the, out there who can, uh, who can do the job. Yeah. They're changing on the fly. Let's yeah. see if they get, uh, too many men on the ice or. <laughs> now there's a Don or, Cherry uh... reference for you. <laughs> His most famous moment as a coach. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. All right, Bruce. Thanks for talking today. All right, we'll talk again later this evening, much later this evening after tonight's 8.30 uh, p.m. Right. Mountain Time start. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>